sort of give you a general introduction to what this is all about, and then talk about the technology of um, optics at the time. Because clearly, I'm going to say that artists used optics, and if they didn't have optics available at the time, how could that be? So I have to show you that optics was available, appropriate optics. And then I'm going to give you some um, quantitative um, evidence. Now, I'm going to show you a couple of equations. And fair warning, the room is dark, the equation is shown, you will be tempted to go to sleep. And uh, the one place in the talk where you should not go to sleep is this part of the talk. Because I'm going to teach you all the optics you need to know to analyze and understand the evidence I'm going to show you, to evaluate the evidence. And I swear to you, I won't teach you any optics you don't need to know. So I'm not going to sneak in any extra optics. And then I'm going to show various kinds of evidence within various paintings that show optics was used early in the Renaissance to create certain features in certain paintings. And then every talk has to conclude. So as an introduction, well, first I list David Hockney as my co-author of the talk. Who is David Hockney? The art historians will know, but others may not. If you look at two well-respected dictionaries of art and artists, uh, perhaps the best known and most critically acclaimed British artist of his generation, uh, posterity is well acquainted with the greatest of modern portraitists. Now, we're not going to argue over whether you think David Hockney, you like his paintings, or you think he's a great portraitist, or whatever. The point of this is David Hockney is a well known, well respected, more than well known, well respected artist who, because of his artistic training, recognized certain features in certain paintings that caused him to look more deeply into those paintings. David Hockney, our most celebrated living artist. He is considered to be one of Britain's greatest contemporary artists. His originality and skill have ensured his success from the beginning of his career. So that's some of the things that are said about David Hockney. A very relevant thing about David, though. I admit, for instance, I'm, I am interested in pictures. I keep saying this, but I'm interested in uh, how you make pictures. David has written about paintings throughout his career. And you can see, if you read his writings, that certain um, paintings, certain features of paintings have bothered him for um, decades. And he kept coming back to, how did certain artists do certain things? And he had to exhibit what I would call a scientific curiosity that led him to look in more detail, rather than just ignoring these features, to try to figure out why it was the case. So where motorcycles enter the picture is that this article appeared in the New Yorker, January of 2000, and um, my co-curator of the art of the motorcycle um, called me, Lawrence Westwood is somebody I acknowledge as credit. My co-curator, Alton Gilfoyle, called me and said, Falco, I don't care what you're doing, drop it. Go by the New Yorker, read this article, and call me back. Well, probably not unlike where you live, the New Yorker doesn't show up in Tucson the same day it does in Manhattan. So it took a couple days to come. And finally, the New Yorker came, and this started me on the, what has been the most intense um, scientific collaboration my entire scientific career. And it's where you can't really plan a career. Uh, I work in molecular beam epitaxy, but I have a thesis named after me in art history. And what's important, as um, this quote says, we detected paintings that deceived so many experts in visual composition for so long. Every example I'm going to show you, every example that we've analyzed, are paintings that are in the Louvre, the Prado, the Metropolitan Museum, Museums, that if you believe the directors of those museums, 25 million people a year visit those museums. 25 million people a year for 100 years have looked at every painting that we've analyzed, and they haven't seen what we saw. So we looked at those paintings and extracted and decided there's more to it than um, other people have noticed before. If you went to the faculty club here, you'd find, I'm sure, old paneled um, uh, room uh, with a uh, very expensive uh, menu, a fine wine list. And if you ask the people that showed up at the faculty club, who come from all the different disciplines, 
Would you agree that optical instruments first appeared around 1600 with the Galileo telescope? Well, people that really knew their history would say, okay, 1600, yes, but Galileo really didn't invent the telescope. He um, marketed the idea, I claim credit for the idea. It came from Holland, but 1600. Mirrors only project an image. Um, if you want to uh, only reflect an image, if you want to project or focus an image, it requires a lens, a refractive lens. Hard to argue with that, except for the people who were in the physics um, class today. They would know otherwise. And Renaissance masters, Van Eyck, Lee, Caravaggio, were by sheer genius alone. If what I'm going to show you today is <coughs> accurate, it means that every one of those statements is wrong. It's wrong, um, they're all wrong, not on minor technicalities, but they're fundamentally wrong. So what the discoveries we've made do is they go to the foundations of a liberal arts education. So please to pay attention to this and see if what I'm going to say is right, if you see any flaws in this. We go back in time and look at artists' attempt to represent the human form in two dimensions. We go back 4,000 years, flat two-dimensional, recognizable as a human, but not very believable as a, as a representation of um, the human form. We come forward in time to about the time of Van Eyck, very elaborate, but still flat and two-dimensional, but then we come to Jan Van Eyck. By magnifying just the, the head, that portrait is so real, if this if that gentleman walked out from behind the screen right now, we would all instantly recognize him. How did Van Eyck do that? Now, this sudden transition to reality, it's been known, I mean, it's been noted and commented on by art historians for 100 years, that there was a dramatic transition from portraits that maybe were elaborate but were not, um, had the, this level of realism, to suddenly they became a number of them, exhibited this level of reality. How did he do it? Well, in fact, there's a really strong um, clue right in the painting. <laughs> Every feature that I'm going to show you today that is based on optical projections could have been done by projecting with one lens from a pair of reading spectacles of the kind that I carry with me, like one and a half diopter or two diopter reading spectacles. I'm going to show you, though, circumstantial evidence we believe indicates concave mirrors were used to begin with, not refractive lenses, for optical reasons that I will talk about. And to show you features of projected images, here's a pair of spectacles I bought at the drugstore for whatever they sell for, $5. And my lab is on the 10th floor of the building looking down on the physics building below. And We'll see, we project it, and she'll stop with the lens aiming. So we see the direct reflection in the lens. We see the building. The sky is below in the projected image. The earth is above. The image is upside down. Something that's not so obvious, but if you look at it for a minute, you can convince yourself of, is the parity of the scene is reversed. Left is reversed for right. That's not the case for mirrors. This is our circumstantial evidence that mirrors were used. Well, let's look at attempts to represent geometrical objects in perspective. Around the time of Van Eyck, we don't need to fit a perfect perspective corrected hexagon to that table to see that there's something not quite right. But we come to Van Eyck again. If I magnify that chandelier, now the thing that's important about this is that painting, the chandelier on that painting, on the real painting is this big. It's the size of my cupped hand. I've taken a feature on a painting that's the size of my cupped hand, and I've expanded it to be 10 feet across, and it maintains that incredible fidelity. It appears as if it's in perfect optical perspective. There's even a size on it. I can, from the size of the candle, I can make some scientific estimates. Now, after we came up with our discovery, Mark LeMay, again, um, fit a perfect computer-generated hexagonal chandelier to the painting in Van Eyck. Let's see 
see how well it fits. Well, at first glance, it fits extremely well. But if you look more closely, you'll see there's some deviations. Like he, on that chandelier that's the size of my cup's hand, he had things are off by a couple of millimeters. A little bit bigger than the size of a pencil lead. As I will show you, if he had understood the laws of geometrical perspective, which had not been developed at that time, he could have, with difficulty, constructed a perfect hexagonal chandelier. But had he projected a real chandelier, there have to be imperfections. A real chandelier, the real chandelier that's above your head, is not um, made perfectly. Our eyes look at it and say, you may be fine, but even from here I can see this candle is leaning backwards, and that one looks more straight. You may say, if you weren't trying to look for those defects, you might say it's perfectly fine. And I'm going to show you the fact that he got so close to perfection, yet deviations from perfection, again, is circumstantial evidence that optics was used. But I'm going to show you much more than circumstantial evidence today. But let's talk about the technology. Could um, concave mirrors have been used to project images? David Lindbergh, some years ago, compiled a list of all the medieval manuscripts on optics, textbooks on optics, over a very important period. There were 61 published between 1,000, which is a time when a Arab scientist, Ibn al-Haytham, wrote a book of optics that was widely influential in Europe, to the time of Van Eyck. There was a new textbook in geometrical optics every seven years, on average. So unlike what we have been taught by our professors, uh, that the medieval period was a time when the cro magnons were fighting dinosaurs and nobody could read. In fact, it was a time of, of intense intellectual activity. Fortunately, they weren't very intelligent. They didn't read English. So um, we have some difficulties. And very few of the texts at the time have been translated into a modern European language. But those that have tell us exactly how to make concave mirrors of the kind we need to project images. So I made a concave mirror, simply with two pieces of metal and some grinding paste. And I made it in one hour, and I projected the image. Oh, you guys, you're from the Midwest. That's called a cactus. <laughs> and that's called a mountain. So uh, ask me later, and I'll explain what those are. So I projected an image in my backyard in this mirror that I made in one hour just by grinding a piece of metal. And um, you can't see on this projector, but there's a wrought iron fence. There's a wrought iron fence. And from the, the size of the wrought iron fence, I can calculate the resolution, the quality of my mirror, the resolution of my mirror. Now, those of you who are scientists will say, looking at this, well, your mirror is 2,000 times worse than the Hubble Space Telescope. <laughs> but it's, in fact, three times better than needed for every feature on every Jan Van Eyck painting. So a mirror that you can make just with grinding paste and hours is more than adequate for Jan Van Eyck to have used. So if a bad mirror can be used, how bad a mirror can we operate with? That's a label from my wholesale restaurant supply company that stamped on stainless steel and had holes in it, spot welded. Let's see if we can project an image with it. It has multiple focal lengths. And I have to show you from the, just from what we're standing, you have to see this is the scene we're trying to project. Now, it's not the world's greatest projected image, but most of you in the sciences, probably all of you, would have bet you couldn't project an image at all. This image, had you done this in 1400, you would have drawn those lines that would have come to vanishing point, and you would have developed the laws of geometrical perspective. It was a horrible mirror. So it doesn't require great optics to do what John Van Eyck did. So one of the nice features about working with somebody like David Hockney is many interesting people have contacted me with useful information. Uh, Peter Schroeder is one of them. He said, are you aware of the description of mirrors in the Romance of the Rose? Well, I confess, 
I wasn't, um, never heard of Romance of the Rose. I found, well, actually this is an experiment that could not be repeated today. I went to the Borders bookstore in Tucson, <laughs> no longer exists, and they had two copies of it on the bookshelf, which tells you that it's widely used today, and you discover it's widely used in the humanities today. And as the translator says, it was at the time of Jan van Eyck, one of the most widely read works in the French language. Jan van Eyck was a court painter for the court of Burgundy, so presumably spoke French. And this is at a time 150 years before Van Eyck. And if we looked at this, of course you can't read that. I've just highlighted in white the uh, passages that re on four pages uh, that refer to the properties of mirrors. And one of them says, Ella Day wrote the copies. That's Ibn al Haytham, the 10th century Arab scientist I told you about, who wrote the Book of Optics that at this time was translated into Latin and was widely influential in European uh, scientific circles. It says, I'm not going to tell you uh, the shapes of mirrors or tell you how rays are reflected or describe their angles. I'm not an expert in medieval French epic poetry, but this seems like awfully technical language for a poem. And if we look, like for example, what he said in the poem is I'm going to say mirror. You're intelligent people. You figure out if I'm talking about a convex mirror, a concave mirror, a flat mirror, because I'm going to tell you everything you need to know. For example, certain mirrors, if you put a bulky object in front of them, even the largest mountains between France and Sardinia will be small. Sardinia is a province in the Pyrenees next to Andorra. And so what he's saying is, if you put the mountains of the Pyrenees in front of certain kind of mirror, they'll be small. That's a convex mirror, a security mirror. This is a property, tell us that. Well, one of the passages says, oh, I even, I'm going to use the yard where I read it, just in there. That's, I mean, that's in Sardinia. Certain mirrors make phantoms appear alive outside the mirror in water or air. Water and air don't rhyme in French. There's the same words in medieval French as they are in modern French. Water and air were of great interest to the medieval philosophers. Like, in air, light travels forever. In a solid, it doesn't go anywhere at all. In water, it's kind of funny. Sometimes water behaves like air, it's transparent. Other times, water behaves more like a solid. And so the philosophers were interested in the properties of water and air for that reason. Before, we never heard about the Romance of the Rose. Um, the BBC filmed this. In part of the BBC film, David had projected the image of a cabbage to uh, uh, kind of uh, reproduce a look of a uh, particular painter, Cotin's painting. So we already know, projected images are upside down. There's a string holding the cabbage, it's upside down. And what I want you to do is I want you to compare how a 21st century artist describes this scene to how it was described in the Romance of the Rose. And I realized this is a color moving. It moves. I mean, uh, it is, it's spinning. It's quite beautiful. Of course, it's upside down. The strings coming from the bottom. And I then realized, my God, this is, a, this is a movie in color. They must have seen it 600 years ago. Our discovery showed they saw it 700 years ago. So what I've shown you to this point is they had the technology to make the mirror. That was a piece of cake, actually. They had um, an understanding of projected images. But that doesn't mean that they actually used projected images. I have to show you that they, that they used them. And for that, you have to wake up and pay attention to the equation. I'm going to show you the optics you need to know to follow this. One thing about optics, which you do understand by living in Indiana, is that if you stood in these railroad tracks in Indiana, they all appear to go to a vanishing point. And just before the train hits you, you go, ah, a vanishing point. But if you look at this more closely, you'll see that these telephone poles, which are almost on the same line, they are deviations from that. And that's because this is not a perfect geometrical construction. Real life, there are deviations from the ideal that we're taught 
in uh, geometry. So if we examine a painting like this, um, after the laws of geometrical objects have been, um, sorry, laws of perspective have been developed, this is too good to be true. Now, I know some of you have traveled on summer programs, you've gone to Italy, you know there's no Italian city ever where the facade of that building is built exactly parallel to the facade of that building. It's <laughs> Italy. So we can infer from the fact that this is so good that that wasn't a real city, just the laws of, um, of geometrical perspective were used to construct that. And you're taught this in art history. Here's a widely used art history book. And in this particular case, we, the camera, the observation point, is above the object. And so the vanishing lines go to vanishing points. And the vanishing points are on a horizon line whose height above the building is the height of the viewpoint. Here I'm below the chandelier. I can guarantee you that that's a real chandelier and it's a real optical uh, based image because I took the picture myself with a digital camera. But we expect a vanishing point. Where's, where are the uh, vanishing points? Where's the horizon line? Well, the fact is that that's a real object, and so small deviations as that chandelier also exhibits, one arm a little bit further forward than the other arm, it just doesn't obey what we were taught as the ideal. But we're going to look for deviations. Things that are very close to being um, you know, complex objects that are very close to being, um, being drawn perfectly, but with deviations, because a real uh, projected image of a real chandelier has to exhibit deviations. Different chandelier in a different Home Depot. And uh, same problem. So that's one thing we're going to look for. Another aspect of objects we're going to use is, let's say we don't know how tall Big Hockey is. We're going to make an estimate. But the average height of a European male is 1.75 meters. That says that the horizontal distance across the scene at the depth into the scene where David is standing is two and a half meters. Well, everyone knows that the length of a molecular demethodactyl console is two meters, so we have to look that up. That says that the photograph, the image, was created with a 22 millimeter focal length lens. My technician took our picture with a 24 millimeter focal length lens. So within the uncertainties of the estimate, it's perfect agreement. But it has to be, it's not magic, it's just the laws of geometrical op optics. It has to be. So if uh, Van Eyck has painted an MDE machine in one of his paintings, we'll be able to extract from that the focal length of the lens that he used. And we're gonna use that. So even if you um, um, aren't interested in getting out there today, this is going to change the way you look at, at movies. So in this, there's Arnold, and he's going to look into the scene, and the cameraman refocus where Arnold's looking. What else has changed? It's something I would bet probably none of you have ever noticed before, and it's something you will be unable not to see from now on. We have two equations of geometrical objects. The magnification is the distance to the image divided by the distance to the object. So if the object is far away and the image is close, we'll have a relatively high magnification. And then the other equation is called the lens maker's equation. An estimate. Well, I can look up that the original film, Arnold was projected onto um, Super 35 millimeter film that tells me the height of the projected image. I'm just going to estimate his head was 300 millimeters tall. So that's going to be part of my estimate. That says the magnification is 0.06. Think about going to a gallery. You're looking at paintings at the wall, on the wall. So somebody's portrait is sort of like this tall. Its magnification is 0.6, not 0.06. The magnification of a typical well, mini, mini portrait is more like half life size, not a tenth life size. So the effect that I'm going to show you is, in fact, much larger in the portraits. And yet we can still see it, even on a movie screen. The back of the trailer, a reflection that we can identify. If you look halfway into the scene, that reflection, she moves. 
the trailer looked like it's gotten shorter. If you look further in, that reflection moves further. It's made almost 10% effect due to refocusing. And the reason for that, the room went so dark, if I focus my lens on this world of three young women, and I change my mind, and it's a better image focus, I change my mind, I want to focus on the AD uh, man in the back row. Counterintuitively, even though I want to focus further away, I actually have to pull the lens toward me to focus further away. My lens is now further from the scene than it was before, so the magnification is reduced. It's a small effect if the magnification is tiny, as it is on your standard, like my iPhone CCD. It's a large effect when it's done at half magnification. So focusing further in the scene reduces the magnification, and we're going to make use of that. Again, mountains. <laughs> so as I let you know where I'm going. As we zoom in on Tom, the mountains, which were in focus, we know the size, same kind of estimate of the head size, so my same estimate of magnification. After zooming in, I've increased the magnification only by a factor of three, but the depth of field, the mountains that were kilometers away, suddenly you can't see at all. The depth of field has decreased from kilometers to hundreds of meters. So increasing magnification decreases the depth of field. We're going to make use of that in analyzing the AD, and we'll skip over those. So how are we proposing that Van Eyck did this, and others did this? A friend uh, dressed to look like a character in a John Van Eyck painting, Cardinal Albergati. His image is reflected and projected by a concave mirror, like a shading mirror, upside down, in living color, on the inside wall. Because of the equations we had, he's further away from the mirror than the image is, so the magnification is less than unity. In fact, if you got up to walk around and see what's going on, he's no longer sitting where he was projected. There is no projected image. He would never know. You wouldn't have to try to deliberately hide it. You just wouldn't know. What we're saying is the artist captures the features of the projected image that he needs to have to create a optics-based real portrait. He then takes that down and can continue working from life to fill in all the detail that he wishes. At that point, there's a drawing. If he wants to make it a painting, he has color. So here's David, 30 second clip. So the BBC, watch his eye, he's winning. He's actually tracing more than he needs to, just for the purposes of uh, demonstration of the camera. So he captures the features that he needs to. At this point, he has an optics-based image. Now he works from life. So these are more complicated. They're not photographs. Do not think of these as the artist essentially performing the function of a piece of photographic film. It's much more complicated. The, he may have had a ugly work on his cheek. A photographic film would have reproduced that. The artist can just ignore it entirely. He was outside, so he can make him outside. But from David's backyard, he can't see the ocean. That doesn't mean he can't create all of this from the total figment of his imagination. Or he can put him inside. Or he can put him with his friend. So the important thing to take away from this is these are collages. Every example we can show you. Some features of some paintings were created with the use of optics. Where optics was helpful to the artist, he used it. If they weren't helpful to the artist, he didn't use it. And I'm going to use the word he instead of they or something neutral because every example that we found of an artist where we can show he used optics was a he. We haven't found any um, examples. Of course, those in our history know there, there were not a large number of female painters at the time. But every artist that we found who used objects was a male. So some features were produced in the aid of the uh, lens. So where in this famous Jan Van Eyck painting would objects be useful? Well, first let's look at the dog. If I magnify the dog, we can recognize the Bichon. The breed is a Bichon. 
I was one of my colleagues raised with Bichons, and he assured me if you take a picture of one of his dogs with a shutter speed and even slower than 500 of a second, the dogs will blur. <laughs> so that tells us either Van Eyck convinced the Arnoldinis to let him kill their dog and stuff it so he could project the image, or Jan Van Eyck had the skill to create a portrait of a dog whose breed is recognizable to us 500 years later. He, I would say that's circumstantial evidence that Jan Van Eyck had the skill not to need optics. I'll show you later that other evidence shows that despite that, he did use optics. Logically, they are separate issues. Would you need something, and would you actually use it? The shoes, you don't need optics for that. You just you need to put those for any other reason. But the chandelier, that's where optics would have been useful to Jan van Eyck in this painting. That chandelier that's the size of your hand, blown up to 10 feet across. But optics don't make marks. Now, scientists have a harder uh, time understanding this than um, artists. Scientists, you know, you project it, there's an image in front of you, you're sort of off and you can trace it exactly as shown. Artist understands, got an image. Well, if I like the image, I'll trace it. If it's not useful to me, I'll ignore it. If I want to alter subjects, I can do that. Optics don't make marks, they produce an image. So even though Van Eyck saw one thing, he may have painted something else. They are not photographs. So if we look at this famous photograph, our famous painting, is this optics based or not? Well, if you analyze these features, if you're smart enough to analyze those features, you'll say, yes, they're optics based painting. But if you only look at this, you would incorrectly conclude the painting is not optics based. You have to know what to look for because these are composite. So in the Arnoldini marriage, if he used a lens to project something, that shin, that sorry, that mirror is round. If the lens were below the mirror, it would have been oval, or above the mirror, it would have been oval. So the fact that it's round says that if he used a lens, the, the height of the lens had to be something like that. So if I magnify this, what's behind there? It's the man in blue Van Eyck and the curtain behind him is camera obscura with the bright object, his concave mirror. So people that are looking for like a wooden box that says camera obscura on it are completely looking in the wrong place. A camera obscura is just as simple as a, a curtain to dim the light. And again, for scientists to say, well, if that's his, his mirror, it can't be, it's square. You can write a perfectly fine, perfectly functional, square mirror, which I turn. The circle, the inside is a circle. Okay, so, now that we understand the optics, let's see if we can use that to analyze the painting. Well, let's go back. This is 75 years before Galileo. David collected together color photocopies of all the images that he thought worthy of further consideration. And his studio in Los Angeles is built on a former tennis court, so that's the length of a tennis court. If I expand the region, he organized it like a scientist, like Mendeleev putting together the, uh, the periodic table of the elements did. He organized things chronologically, paintings from up, uh, northern Europe and the upper wall, southern Europe and the lower wall, trying to see what was happening where, is there any kind of connection. And this painting in particular caught my eye on my first visit. It just led to remarkable discoveries. If we look at this painting, there's several things I want you to notice. One is the central feature seems to go out of focus. And I'm, I'll show you that better in a minute. The other is there's a woman. She's going to be our meter stick in the painting in a way that I'll show you. So if I magnify that central feature, in focus, out of focus. Well, so what? You've seen countless photographs where in focus, out of focus. If you had never seen a projected image, you never would have seen this phenomenon. If you had actually been there, you would have looked at the wine bottles, they would have been in focus, you would have looked back, you would have seen that car, 
your brain, without telling you it was doing it, would have caused the muscles in your pupil and your eyeball to contract, to refocus further away. And you would have, in your brain, constructed an image that was entirely in focus. So the fact that this is in focus and out of focus, 75 years before Galileo, is extraordinarily strong circumstantial evidence that a projected image was involved. Never would have seen that phenomena to um, have reproduced it. One set of vanishing lines, a second set further in. And as I'll show you, there's a third set. If I try to correct for perspective, though, there's nothing I can do that reproduces an octagon. You can just see that's too tall and wrong. And optics tells us why that's the case also. So let me put this back into the painting. It goes out of focus somewhere in here. At the same depth where the octagonal pattern goes out of focus, let's look at this pattern. If I magnify it, one set of vanishing lines in the front, another set in the back, and they differ by three degrees. So I, yeah, I'll talk about that too when I talk about the infrared. More for now. Let me try to reproduce that. Well, if I, if I were a professor in DePauw, I would have the money to buy a Turkish carpet for my house. Um, but I don't. So I have to make do with a um, geometrical bed spread. And the experiment I'm going to do is I'm going to mount a 35 millimeter camera with a modern high quality lens on a tripod. And the only thing I'm allowed to move is the focus of the lens in and out. Take a photo of the front. Move my lens to focus further. You can see it's going a little bit out of focus. This eye quality lens. I'll refocus there. Take another picture and I'll piece together this photo. I'll Photoshop that with that photo. As if I took them separately and I'll Photoshop them together. Well, they look pretty good, but if you examine them more closely, you'll see that that color has changed. And not coincidentally by three degrees. So we've reproduced that effect. Well, let me try again to set a perspective corrected octagon to this. There's, um, I'm not going to use the um, size information in today's lecture, but there's a ruler on there. So I'll correct for perspective, get rid of the ruler, and I'll make this blue, and I'll try to fit it to the painting. Well, depends on if you're an optimist or a pessimist. Optimists think, God, look at that gray green. Pessimists think it doesn't fit at all. But this isn't what Lorenzo Lara would have seen if he projected an image at very high magnification, 0.56 as we will see. Um, he would have seen something that I have to simulate in Photoshop. This is several depths of field into the subject. It's completely out of focus. Well, let's make the marks in the part that's in focus and then refocus. And as we saw from our discussion of optics, I want to focus further away. I have to pull the lens toward me, which reduces the magnification. Well, it doesn't fit here at all. But that doesn't matter, because we've already marked that in. <laughs> now it fits here. We'll mark that in. One more time. We mark that in. And the agreement's within a couple millimeters. If it's a real carpet, it can't be perfect agreement, because it's a handmade carpet. The woman. The woman is our meter stick. The distance across her shoulders in the painting is 10 inches. The distance across a real woman's shoulders is 18 inches. I know that because I have a wife and two daughters. So I have three data points. In the land of the Daedalus, the man with three data points is king. Coincidentally, in this triangular pattern, it turns out to be, it would be distance of two centimeters, exactly two centimeters. The magnification is 0.56, goes out of focus somewhere between 5 and 90 feet distances in. So now I know the depth of field in real units of centimeters. I can use equations of geometrical optics to calculate properties of the lens. I have my two equations from geometrical optics, magnification in the front, depth of field in the front that I've measured. After refocusing, I have the other region. So I have six equations and seven unknowns. What does that mean? This is it. I'm going to take a look at the one day, algebra, and save our lives. Six equations, 
seven unknowns, if I make one assumption, the equations solve everything. There's nothing else I can do. I'm going to make the assumption that the lens was about four feet from the carpet. And I've got error bars on it. It, it can't be 20 feet, it can't be two inches. So I have error bars and, and I calculate. If that is the case, I have different depths of field, different magnifications. And so geometrical optics dictate that if a lens was used, there have to be three regions and three depths of field. It fits more quantitative. So there's my first fit, the distance from that peak to that, was there after refocusing, it decreased by 13.1%. I calculate from algebra, it should have decreased by 12.6%. It agrees to half a percent accuracy in a painting. After refocusing a second time, it magnification changed by a different amount, I calculated a different amount, and again it agreed to a half a percent. Is it a coincidence? No. We're not saying optics is the only way to get perspective correct. We're saying actually optics is the only way to get perspective wrong in precisely the way the artist got the perspective wrong. There are other ways to get perspective correct. These errors, if you will, come inevitably from the use of, of a lens. So let me jump to infrared. I showed some of this today. With infrared, and I'm going to do this very quickly, infrared has a nice feature that it penetrates further into new pigments than does visible. So that looks like this in the infrared. I developed a high resolution infrared camera, and that's our favorite painting, Lorenzo Lotto. Took it to St. Petersburg, I'm gonna go faster, and we can see some infrared. This is over here. This is the, the painting in the visible. And there are many things I can show you. We'll concentrate on a couple of things. Notice he's wearing black, she's wearing black. In the infrared, her black is different. I'll just say for our historians, I read this in one place that it, it is written that the woman was dead at the time the portrait was finished. I'm just going to make this up. I can imagine Lorenzo Lotto taking time to complete the portrait. She's alive at the time, painted in happy, bright colors. She dies. He needs to repaint at least that part in more somber colors. And he just happens to use a different black that has different infrared properties. But whether or not that speculation is true is irrelevant. Let's take the central octagonal pattern that I showed as three regions that all take place over the course of two and a half inches. Imagine a three by five card on the side. All of this machine is in three regions in one little area of the canvas. There was the same color blue there. I'll magnify it as much as I can to fit on the screen. And I just, for our purposes, we want to concentrate on the triangular pattern. Very assured line, traced kind of line. After he refocuses, the magnification changes. You cannot match a geometrical pattern after magnification changes. He struggles with that, finally gets on a roll, and then refocuses again and gives up. So in the course of this little two and a half region, inch region, he has three distinct subregions exactly as optics says would have to be the case. This on the side, now I'm going faster because I'm running late. That's a repeat pattern. Let me take that over here and make a number of identical repeats, correct for perspective, and lay on top of the carpet. Well, he's rounded the curve, so it's got a miss there. Fits really well, as well as you'd expect for the, the handmade carpet. But if I do the next one, it doesn't fit at all. It's just completely going the wrong direction. But if I correct for perspective, if I refocus my lens and correct for perspective, again, it fits. So it's the same place where I showed you had to refocus, again, you have to refocus. And it agrees with the numerous. So here I have an art education student who reproduced this. So a short clip, there's the octagonal pattern drawn to scale that I calculated the original pattern had to be, one lens of a pair of spectacles. That image is projected onto John's canvas. He first paints in the region closest to him in blue. John had to finish the blue region. And now he refocuses, and he's painting onto a uh, piece of transparent plastic. 
is all done is an overlay on a life-size copy of the main scene. We both see the move to the when you focus the further away and move the lens forward, reduce the magnification. He matches that up, finishes the middle region. Again, pulls the lens closer, reduces the magnification. The final region, and then we'll see how well this fits to an actual life-size copy of the Lorenzo Lotto painting. It's perfect. And you go to my webpage, so I'll simply have, and you can download and look at all the evidence. Different example, Cardinal Albergato. I think this guy's hiding something, and I think we're going to figure this out. There is a drawing and a painting, one of the few drawings and painting pairs that exist from this time period, and the drawing is 40% smaller than the painting. So I haven't the correct relative scale here. You need to just magnify the head itself. At this point, they look, could be identical. But let me make one semi-transparent and overlay them on the other. And we'll come back to here, so off. But here, I mean, various reasons are off. But the face, again, magnified. Now, I've magnified to the point that that, you know, mental lens is wider than um, any of these blue lines. And yet every wrinkle, every eyelash in that central face is within millimeter accuracy of a drawing that's been enlarged by 40% to a painting before um, hantographs ever were invented, as if that would have been a, a way to do that. But if I put it back, I have these other features. If Van Eyck had captured Cardinal Albergati, and I can give you a reason why this would have happened, um, and you've got the drawing, presumably Cardinal Albergati painted paid for a painting of this big, and Van Eyck has a drawing of this big. Well, you don't just give the Cardinal you know, colors and say, I know you can't do this big, I'm giving you this. It wasn't a good career move to do that. You've got to figure out a way to make something bigger. The same optical setup does that, but it doesn't have a field that's large enough to have everything in, in view. So let's do the same thing that I showed you in the Water. Must have done. We'll copy in the features, magnify by, by 40% now. This is the magnified version by 40%. We'll copy in what we can do, and now translate it sideways. Maybe we're not going to just burn it at the stake. I can match this together. I'll fill these in, slide again, fill those in, and finally do the head. So now I have this at 40% larger than the drawing. Let's see how well that fits to the painting. And it fits perfectly. So optics simultaneously explains why the features have millimeter accuracy in the, in the individual regions, but why there are four separate regions. It couldn't be any other way than if optics were used. And again, John just reproduced this on clear um, acetate, 40% larger than the drawing, and with this finished glass region, he's done all the others. Now he slides that life size drawing that's 40% larger, enlarged by a concave mirror, does the last little ear, and then we jump ahead and overlay it on the life size copy of the painting. So this painting, in fact, on the screen is approximately life size. It's huge. It's six feet by six feet. And for example, if I magnify that globe and I turn it upside down, like the word Sicily, it's in five-point font. Your computer doesn't give you five-point font because it's too small to read. Who would want to do five-point font? Hans Holbein covered this entire canvas at that level of accuracy upside down. What the heck is that? Well, if you walk up to the front and you look at the grazing angle, you see it's a skull. But it's not a good skull. It's kind of a bad skull. The jaw's too long, the balls back here. It's just some, not a good skull. 
So if I linearly compress that at all, it looks like this. Draws too long, balls back here, sinister eyes. That's really evil. Word. That's a, I mean, if you were trick or treating and you came across that, yeah. somebody's house was just on the front step, you'd go to the next house. Um, that's a real skull. Can optics explain this? Uh, there are other ways of, of producing an anamorphic image. You can draw on a sort of regular graph paper with the images you want to reproduce, and then you have nonlinear graph paper in every place that intersection. You translate over to here and so on. But if you did that, once you go back again to graph paper, you get back to your original drawing, exactly as it was, subject to any distinction. So I'll take the skull, if there were a circle, and I projected it with a concave mirror, it would be elongated. That's giving me my anamorphic image. I'm projecting that at a graded angle on my canvas. So you think if I take a picture, I can show you an anamorphic skull. And what the skull looks like, if I take the mirror away, um, that's the skull. So that's the point of view of the image. So after I do all the things I do to it, when I come back to the end, I should get a skull that looks like this. Well, if I take the picture, it doesn't work out. Depth of field is a problem. Only the jaw is in focus. Well, let me paint the part in that's in focus. At this point, the rest of my canvas is blank. I'll refocus my lens. Now the teeth are in focus. I'll copy those in. And I'll piece it together that way. Each time I exceed the depth of field, I'll just refocus. There's a skull, I'm just going to rotate it upward. That's what the skull looks like. Now let me linearly shrink it. Doesn't look right. That's what I said we're, we should get back, we thought, but we get back a jaw that's too long, a bulge, and a sinister eye, which we've seen before. And we can even see where Holbein made a mistake. He accidentally reproduced the structure, which is really easy to do when you're projecting something like this. Should have painted that. For the mathematically inclined, an alternative explanation, the magnification is linear in that direction because it's more of a sine data in this direction, and it's piecewise segmented. So if Holbein knew how to solve a piecewise segmented nonlinear transformation, he could have calculated something to plot. So that's an alternative explanation. I'll skip that. So if artists uh, started using optics in 1425, when did they stop? Because artists carry students from different, who are interested in different era. What I'm going to do is every painting I'm about to show you in chronological order is one from which we can show optics was used to, to create at least one of the features in the painting. Starting in 1425, with the Chimpanzee Baroque altarpiece, and I'm going to come up to present in 18 seconds. So if you blink, you're going to miss a century worth of art history. So this is a complete art history class of optics art history in 18 seconds. And the paintings are going to go by, they're all by name brand artists. And they'll go by faster than I can even uh, hope to name them. But we have Ken Van, Van Eyck, Memling, Montaigne, it's going to be fast. More Caravaggio. So the answer is that optics never stopped being used. It's been continuously used in various forms from Jan van Eyck till today. So we've got overwhelming evidence in a number of paintings, only a tiny fraction of which I have time to show you today, that lenses were used as aids for creating certain portions of certain paintings. They are not photographs, they're complex composites. And because the artist is not compelled to exactly reproduce what's projected in front of them. They produce an image, a look, a means of measurement. It does allow remarkably, uh, remarkable new insights into specific aesthetic choices. If I can show you what a feature that's based on optics, and I can show you that an artist of the um, reputation of Van Eyck deviated from what the um, 
projecting into what's in front of them, that insight into a specific aesthetic choice and arts of the fame and reputation of John Lennon uh, made. Optics and understanding of optics allows you to answer questions you didn't even know you could ask before. It does fundamentally affect our understanding of the history of art. That this has been known, that this sudden transition to um, realism, it has a wide right application in the teaching of painting, photography, and so on. Here's what's so revolutionary about what you're saying. You're saying the history of art, the history of the Renaissance, is the history of optics. I know. Sir. I know that. And you're blowing everything up. You're blowing everything that all of us who took art appreciation study, all of the art historians have written, and you're saying you're all wrong. It's all about optics. So a lot of art historians don't like history. It is a paradigm shift in, in understanding the paintings of the time. This is the end. So thank you. <laughs>